Hi, this is Congressman Bob H. Scott from Virginia's 3rd Congressional District, and I chair the House Committee on Education and Labor. Today is Worker Memorial Day. It's an opportunity to remember the workers who have lost their lives and an opportunity to recommit to making workplaces safe. Today, I spoke with two people who have firsthand knowledge on what OSHA could and should be doing to protect workers. David Michaels, a former head of OSHA from 2009 to 2017, and Kathy Kennedy, a vice president at National Nurses United and a registered nurse in a neonatal intensive care unit in Roseville, California. Dr. Michaels, it's good to have you with us today. We've got, uh, we're trying to address the uh, problem uh, with uh, workplace safety and we've seen a disturbing pattern of infections in a wide range of workplaces, not only healthcare facilities, but also prisons, nursing homes, meat packing plants, uh, many other settings. Uh, what unique authority does OSHA have in doing something about it? Well, Mr. Chairman, first, thank you for taking on this issue. OSHA is the only federal agency with the authority, with the power to tell employers they must protect workers. You know, the Centers for Disease Control puts out recommendations, but that's all they are. OSHA has the ability to say, you must make these changes because workers must be safe. And, you know, the, and the, let me say there's <laughs> very uh, sadly, OSHA is not utilizing that authority. Uh, issuing recommendations isn't enough. You have to require employers to do the right thing. Now, what is, what is unique about OSHA in terms of being able to address problems in every different kind of workplace? We've seen uh, things pop up, uh, senior citizen homes, meatpacking plants, prisons, uh, letter carriers, grocery stores. How does uh, the expertise at OSHA allow them to address each situation, each unique situation? situation appropriately. Well, that's right. OSHA covers seven or eight million workplaces, everything from construction sites to uh, nail salons, and you know, all these essential workers who are doing this fundamental work to make sure that food gets to our table, that uh, buses are running, the airplanes are flying, everything we need to keep the economy going. OSHA has the authority to make sure workers are safe, that employers protect those workers. The best way OSHA can do that is by issuing a standard, by saying this is what an employer must do. Uh, now, we've got a, a fast moving situation here with coronavirus. We're learning a lot about the natures of exposure, how fast it takes, the outcomes, what sort of workers are exposed. And so what OSHA needs to do is make it clear that as the science progresses, they need to, every employer needs to apply that science and they have to take whatever steps are necessary, whether it's in you know, a farm where workers are working together harvesting crops, to meat processing plants, to grocery stores, and everywhere else. Now, it occurs to me that some of these uh, protections don't seem to be particularly expensive. Uh, Alice, I checked into a hotel the other day and found the people checking me in were behind a plexiglass screen and they were wearing masks and it occurred to me that couldn't have cost that much but it probably provided a lot of attention uh what kind of uh, very inexpensive but required uh accommodations could osha be insisting on today well you know a lot of what they're asking for what they should be requiring is common sense you know the most important thing to prevent this exposure is to keep people far enough away from each other, from other workers in the public. Now, plexiglass is, is one way to do that. Um, certainly, when necessary, masks and face shields do that. But distance is the key thing. Uh, now, sometimes that's inexpensive. Sometimes that could be, ex be more expensive. If you're on a chicken line, for example, where normally the workers are just in terrible conditions, you know, elbow to elbow, it's cold, they're making repetitive cuts over and over. The only way you could do that safely, I think, is if you give people more distance on the line, and that may mean slowing down the chicken line. You're gonna to have to process those chickens a little more slowly and may raise the cost of chickens. But you know the cost of this pandemic has been in enormous in the trillions of dollars. We could spend a little bit more on chicken to make sure workers aren't killed by this virus. Now uh, you indicated that this uh, has come up uh, kind of quickly. Does OSHA have um, a way to deal with emergencies? 
Oh boy, Ultra not only has a way, but we were ready. Uh, <laughs> you know, after the H1N1 epidemic in 2009, it was very clear to OSHA that we needed an emergency standard, or we needed a standard, really, to deal with airborne infectious disease. And uh, when I was running OSHA, we were preparing a standard that could have been issued that would tell employers exactly what to do to protect workers in situations like this COVID-19 problem. Um, OSHA knows what to do, and the law says that without really any difficulty at all, they could issue an emergency standard telling employers what they have to do to protect workers. But right now, OSHA, the labor department run by Secretary of Labor Eugene Scalia, they just have decided not to do that. It is incomprehensible to me. Uh, what, so what happens when they don't take uh, appropriate action? Well, the proof that employers won't do what's necessary unless they are told they must do it are the thousands of meat workers who are sick right now. We knew months ago that only by protecting workers, by separating them, by giving them proper personal protective equipment, sanitary facilities, are we going to stop the spread of this virus? The big meat companies looked at that. They looked at the recommendations and they said, forget it. What we're going to do is offer people a little more money if they come into work every day. And as a result of that, we have thousands of workers across the country who have been infected by this terrible virus. Uh, when workers uh, complain, um, is there is retaliation a problem? The very core of the OSHA law says that workers need to be protected from retaliation by their employer if the worker raises safety and health concerns with their employer or with OSHA. We've seen report after report in the newspapers of workers who are fired for raising these concerns. In fact, there have been workers from security guards to physicians who were fired for wear, bringing their own masks into work, and now the CDC says everybody should be wearing masks. OSHA is supposed to be protecting workers. They need to be doing investigations. President Trump, Secretary Scalia should be on TV every day telling employers, you have no right to retaliate against workers for expressing their concerns about safety. In fact, if you retaliate against workers, if you fire them, if you don't give them overtime, we will investigate and when appropriate, we will prosecute. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, prisoners um, being exposed to the virus. It seems to me if we have initiatives that protect the uh, prison guards, the workers in the prisons, that we can do a lot to reduce the incidence of um, the virus in the prisons. What kinds of things could OSHA do to um, uh, reduce the incidence of the virus uh, spreading out throughout prisons? Well, you know, one of the, the limitations that OSHA has is federal OSHA doesn't cover state and county workers. And so in states like Ohio, which has a, a significant problem of COVID-19 in the prisons there, the prison guards actually do not have OSHA coverage. And that's something that Congress should really address. There are states, though, with OSHA coverage of, of state and county workers, and there are, of course, private prisons, and those private sector uh, employers are covered by OSHA. You know, the same rules apply. You've got to make sure people are, are have some distance, they have proper hand washing facilities, uh, they have masks when necessary. Of course, there are a lot of people who probably should be released from prisons right now if they don't have to be there because uh, they're both spread, they're likely to... Uh, receive the disease and transmit the disease if they're in prison. And we know both in cities around the country that community transmission is much elevated when there's a prison in that community. In Ohio, for example, we have community members who've gotten sick because the guards who go in and out of the prisons, the, the correctional officers, are bringing the disease throughout the community. So this is just one more area where OSHA, the state health departments, um, and the CDC need to step in immediately to reduce exposure. Uh, you mentioned the um, idea that um, Congress needs to step in and cover certain um, agencies that are not now covered. What exactly should Congress be doing now in the absence of any um, initiation initiative from, from uh, OSHA? Well, right now, uh, your legislation, which says that OSHA must immediately issue an emergency standard 
to cover all private sector workers and those public sector workers who right now fall through the cracks who don't have OSHA coverage. That's the number one imperative right now. The only way we're gonna have an important immediate impact in thousands of workplaces across the country is if OSHA tells all those employers that unless they clean up their act, unless they start protecting workers, they face fines and civil penalties. How are we going to reopen the country and get people back to work if they're going to go back to the same conditions that could lead to these sort of exposures? Well, uh, thank you uh, very much for being with us today. Is this today? Is there anything else uh, you, you'd like to um, add? No, I appreciate your leadership on this. I hope Congress uh, can get together and pass this legislation uh, as quickly as they can. Well, thank you, Dr. Michaels, for being with us today. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Kathy, for being with us today. I appreciate uh, the work you've done as a representative of the National Nurses United. I understand that you've conducted surveys of nurses around the country. Uh, what have you heard from nurses around the country in terms of what's going on with the coronavirus? Well, Chairman Scott, what we've been seeing around this country is that nurses and other healthcare workers do not have the correct protection, uh, excuse me, personal protective equipment, PPE, that they need in order to do their jobs, to care for the patients without exposing not only ourselves, but um, other patients, families, and communities. And um, that's just not um, acceptable. Um, we have been conducting surveys uh, across the states, and what we found is what, so, some of the survey questions that we've been asking is, how prepared is your hospital? Do you have the correct, proper uh, PPE? And so we, we have found that um, many of the hospitals were not prepared, and they didn't have the, uh, enough uh, PPE for the nurses and other healthcare workers. And what happens when uh, nurses are not properly protected? When they're not properly protected, then they are they are not safe, that they could become exposed to this very virulent virus, um, which inadvertently can expose other patients, our families, and our, and our community. So it's really important that um, we have the protections that we need. <clears throat> um, have they complained? Are you talking about the nurses? The nurses have nurses complained. Oh, absolutely, we've complained. We've been we have been shouting from the rooftops since you know when we first heard about this virus, um, and we really wanted to make sure we had time for the hospitals. Uh, the hospitals had time to get prepared for this, but they didn't. And so you know, ever since that time, you know, nurses have been um, a right in the front, really protesting and and stating that we need the proper uh, protection equipment. We need um, hospitals to really uh, utilize the precautionary principle, which is the highest standard, because we don't know anything about this virus. We're still learning, and really, you need to have, and you need to make sure that nurses and healthcare workers have what they need. You can always take off layers of protection, but you can never put it back. And so, this is something that we have been saying all across the United States, and we continue to um, insist on making sure that not only the nurses, but the healthcare workers have what they need in order to protect themselves and our patients. And, and what happens when they complain? What happens when they complain? Well, <clears throat> we know that nurses have been threatened. Um, they've been threatened termination. Um, they have been told uh, that this is what this is all that they have um, in California. We had several nurses who, because they spoke up, um, they were suspended. Now, here in California and other states where we have unions, <clears throat> excuse me, nurses know that there are rights that they have, and so in order to um, ensure that nurses have what they need, they did speak up. Um, the nurses in California uh, that were suspended, eventually, because of protests that the nurses uh, put on during shift changes, really saying that we need to um, have the correct, proper PPE and 
the nurses that spoke up and were suspended needed to be reinstated. This went on for a couple of weeks and those 10 nurses are now back at their hospitals working and they are receiving the proper PPE that they need to care for the patients. Uh, what should um, OSHA regulators be doing? Are you talking about the federal? The federal OSHA regulators, could they come in and insist that uh, protection uh, be available? Well, what we need is we do need a federal OSHA um, standard, which would allow, well, let me not say allowed, which would require hospitals to make sure that they're providing the correct PPE for the nurses and the healthcare workers and to really ensure that they are uh, making sure that everyone is safe. And that's what we really believe is most important right now. Because across the states, you're seeing it, people are dying. Our registered nurses, our doctors, healthcare workers are dying. You know, and, and right now it's important for um, you to know uh, and everyone to know that this is real, that people are dying every day. And we know that maybe at least 84 registered nurses have died since, since this virus has come stateside. And we can't have more healthcare workers dying of this disease or becoming sick because who would take care of the patients? Who would operate the ventilators? Who would provide the care? So it's really important that you understand and the policy makers understand, Congress understand that this is about life and death. Well, I want to express my appreciation for you uh, being with us today. I think your testimony has been uh, compelling and we're going to try to um, enact that enforceable standard so that um, hospitals know exactly what kind of protection to provide. So um, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Chairman Scott.